Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to Orange Plate Special. We're delighted that you're spending part of your lunchtime with us today. I'm Mark Blakeman. I'm the Marilyn and Carl Toma Executive Director of the McKnight Center for the Performing Arts at Oklahoma State University. I'm web streaming from the stage of our recital hall here at the McKnight Center. We're delighted that you're joining us for today's episode. We're really delighted to have organist Peter Krasinski with us um, today. Uh, some of you who are uh, regular subscribers, ticket buyers of the McKnight Center will remember that Peter performed um, at the McKnight Center uh, last Halloween. Um, he improvised an incredible musical score to the silent film, The Phantom of the Opera, and I was he and I were visiting before we went live. Um, it, frankly, I think caught a lot of people off guard because they weren't quite what to, uh, know exactly what to expect and had a really delightful time. And we were very pleased to announce during our season announcement that Peter would be joining us again in our second season, um, this time uh, performing music to the film Nosferatu. So Peter, thanks so much for being with us. We're really um, delighted to talk to you today. And you're, um, you're streaming from Boston, is that right? Correct. And so I'm just going to start with um, some some the 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 basics here I think um, what it, what is it that you do as the organist when you uh, perform with a silent film how would you characterize that uh, to put it in very basic terms uh, whatever's on the screen goes through my eyes and I see that and then it goes into my heart and then it comes out of my hands very nice it's basically it sounds a little romanticized but that's really sort of what happens uh, and of course that happens by three major things and that is first of all knowing the film by heart i study the film memorize the plot lines understand what's happening both in the environments that are presented in the picture the emotions that are presented the storyline uh, and i absorb that and then musically i also simply draw on my my past uh, musical examples from both being in an orchestra as a violinist or singing in a choir all of that music uh, and that becomes the score that always in my head has to really it has to really follow the film um, i want it to be about the movie not about the music it has to be an organic thing mm -hmm. i want to step back just for a second and ask you a couple of things. I'm curious about your relationship with this instrument. Um, how is it that you found the organ? Is Did you start off um, studying you know, piano and then you found an interest in organ or were you fascinated by that instrument from an early age? So that's one question. And then I also would like for you to talk about your um, development of your skills as an improviser. Um, because we, I come from a classical music background, and the most paralyzing thing you can do for most classical musicians is take their music away from them. <laughs> so um, I'm curious about how it is that you as an organist um, really d delved into and developed these skills as an as a improviser. Well, it, as, it, at an early age, the most paralyzing thing for me was when someone put a piece of music in front of me. Okay. It, it's that different kinds of minds that everybody has. For me, uh, the idea of notation was, as a child, rather difficult to handle, probably a little dyslexia there and, and different sort of learning tasks in my head. Uh, so I was always playing the piano as a little kid. We had a little upright grand in the house, and I was always banging on it by the time I could reach the keys. I was already experimenting with it. And the two major outside influences from the home, uh, well, uh, the home, first of all, my mom was a cellist, an amateur cellist. So that music was always happening. She was always practicing for the infamous Quincy Symphony Orchestra, uh, which was a, a delightful, uh, wonderful group that still exists today, uh, Quincy, Massachusetts. Um, but a church was one place, Bethany Church in Quincy, which had a big four manual, four keyboard pipe organ. And as a little kid, I was obsessed with that sound and I just loved it. A church, it was a congregational church, very friendly, very open. Uh, and I love the music since four years old. Uh, the other place would have been um, 
the Stoneham Town Hall, which is a Massachusetts town that has, has a Wurlitzer in it. It just was recently restored again. Uh, and there is where I heard my first silent films. Hmm. And I actually saw them again as a kid. One of the more famous moments back when I was maybe about seven, the organist always after the film plays a few popular tunes and says, uh, would anyone like to hear something? And he spotted me up in the balcony, raising my hands. He said, you young man, what would you like to hear? And I said, Finlandia by Sibelius. <laughs> <laughs> he kind of stepped back a little bit. And, you know, we played the theme. And so those two instruments uh, got me going as a kid. That's fantastic. And were you, did you have an interest then in, in improvisation independent of the film aspect? and you married these two things together, you found that you had an aptitude for this, or were you really developing your improvisational skills as an accompaniment to film? It's interesting because for me, um, as my musical life progressed, um, it was a struggle for me to read music, actually. Uh, it really was. But fortunately, I found the violin. And through the violin, I was able to only have to read one line. It was sort of one step at a time. And I was able to read one line of music and also be involved with other people, which was really important and hear mm -hmm. an enormous amount of, of music. We were in the Greater Boston Youth Symphony Orchestra. And of course, this was all written music. And for fun, I would play the piano. I actually played at the Sheridan Boston Hotel cocktail bar for a while. And in my little church jobs, as they progressed from one church to the next church, uh, improvisation became a really helpful skill during certain parts of the service where I needed to go from a place to another. I remember in junior high school, before the music teacher would come in, I'd always improvise and kids would read from different books and uh, I would echo what they were reading. So it was a bit of a gift, I think, uh, from early on. But it's always, for me, been a journey to uh, try to find both of those worlds of where they both meet the idea of, of actual real form being involved and and the the nuts and bolts of music informing the improvisation so that it actually sounds like a composed piece that's one of my goals too i think that our audience was i think part of um them being surprised or not really knowing what to expect uh, about your performance last fall um, is the fact that everything is improvised, that you're not using any score. To, to what extent, when you perform to the same film, do you carry certain aspects? Are there certain threads that kind of tie together um, for each performance, maybe th thematically for certain characters in the film? and how much of it is really spontaneous and, and maybe even inspired by the way the audience responds to uh, the film itself, and are you able to incorporate the, that audience's energy then into your performance? Yes, going backwards, uh, the, the audience is a really big part of it. Uh, uh, the audience uh, somehow match, I, I don't know what it is, but it's part of being a human being, isn't it? You get into a room and you meet somebody else and all of a sudden you already have an idea uh, even before they've opened their mouth of what this person is like and it felt that way coming on your stage i was like oh this is going to be fun <laughs> it was <laughs> a lot a of fun great audience. they were ready to enjoy it and that made me feel like i could really take some risks and have some fun with it and it paid off um so yes the audience has a lot to do with it the venue has a lot to do with it. What is the venue like? Is it is it old? Is it new? What is it like? And also the instrument I'm playing. In this case, it was an electronic, very beautiful um, Allen electronic free manual organ that had been set up to my specifications very nicely. So all of that was lined up. Um, and then g going back to, let's see, the first question was about um, were you um, already interested in, in improvisation, um, oh, yes. which came first, well, the improvisation I, 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 or the interest in the silent film? Right. It was the improvisation was always there. And then when I saw it being done by an improviser, I got excited. But I also know that part of your question was the music itself. When I play, um, oh, that's, yes. how much 
real music, you know, pre-done music? And it's a great question because I did Phantom of the Opera. And if you recall, Phantom of the Opera has its own story, but within that story is an opera by Guno. <laughs> it's Faust. It's, it's an actual That's opera. Right. And you see people on the stage singing the Jewel song, the spinning song. There's the, the, the magnificent going into heaven scene, all of that stuff. So indeed, yes, I actually did study all the Guno and listen to it and looked at the scores and do draw from music. When something on the film is an actual piece, I actually try to find that piece and try to be as close as possible to what that piece actually would sound like there. Uh, one of my favorite parts of that is when Carlotta is singing the Jewel song, I actually put in wrong notes. Uh, uh. So that, uh, you know, it's a, uh, Christine is all like, oh my God, Carlotta is singing again and the Phantom's all upset. So I actually purposely put in wrong notes for her singing so that there's justification for their being upset. So it's, it's a combination of both things, the actual real music and then improvised that's right in the moment. You did, you mentioned, you know, kind of t getting a read on our audience and being able to feel like you could take some risks. You did some really fun things before you even started the performance. Um, of course, you came out with a giant cape on, so it was very, it was a very showy entrance. But you took the uh, audience through an exercise of practicing their their screaming and being being surprised, <laughs> which was a lot of fun. I think it set a great tone for the for the whole performance. I think people immediately knew we're really going to have fun tonight, and that was a great way to set up um, the tone and the energy for the performance. That was a lot of fun. Um, I I. I know that you perform um, around the U.S. You've done, you've performed internationally. I know that you're teaching also, and I wanted to ask about. Um, I think that you teach improvisation, or you, or you've taught master classes on in improvisation. I understand with the Harvard Organ Society, um, among others. And I'm just curious, how do you? How do you teach somebody to improvise when it's something that clearly is supposed to be spontaneous and, and organic? What, is that, what does that look like when you're working with a, a um, budding musician who has an interest in improvisation? How do you counsel them? How do you, how do you help them develop those skills? Well, in an overall general sense, one of the first things I ask if it's a group and it's a master class with a number of people that are present, I always ask this question, how many of you started music by reading it and how many of you started music by hearing it and playing it back and that doesn't that's not a judgment call or anything that's limiting any of the participants it's showing them where they are in terms of their their background where did they come from how did they learn what music was and that can sometimes be a big stumbling block if to you music is always what's on the page and it has to be that and you know what? That's a good thing. <laughs> if you're playing, if you're playing in an orchestra, you don't want Toscanini to point you out because that's not going to be a pleasant moment. You have to play what's there. But at the same time, there's this ability to be able to bend what's there or to change what's there, uh, and to also create. And so I try with my students to find where they are. Are they more about reading? And then we start with music right in front of us. And I asked them, how could you change this melody? For instance, if there's a, a, an answer and question, you know, a question and answer, call and response, this sort of thing. Make the response different than what the composer has written. And we go that way and we start building this freedom. And it's the freedom that I want them to experience more than anything. The idea that they really can do it, they're not being judged about it. It's something that they will themselves decide, how am I doing at this? How am I finding this out. And I find many, many times some beautiful moments where people suddenly realize, oh, this isn't dangerous anymore, and I'm not going to get punished for it, which is sadly a feeling I have seen a lot. And what's beautiful is the, the next step, which I love to do myself, is to bring that freedom back to composed music mm -hmm. and to written music. So that when an orchestra is uh, playing, a whole orchestra, and the audience is like, wow, what just happened? And what has happened is they've taken this idea of, this is the first time this has ever happened. 
but we're also the big other part is theory, music theory and study. This is also sort of the drag part, you know, like the sad, oh gosh, we got to really work at this. Mm -hmm. Oh, we got to work at it? Yeah. You have to really know, for instance, um, part of the reason of the success of these improvisations that you heard for that film was that I know that if I keep on doing the same thing in the same key in the same rhythm for more than two minutes, that audience is going to start leaving the seats <laughs> because it's not going to be interesting anymore. So it's that a basis of musical theory, the study along with the freedom is what, what makes it all work. It's a really interesting what you said, my, and my training is pretty traditional, and the idea of improvisation, you know, scare, scares me, scares the heck out of me. And I spend lots of hours just sight reading. You know, I'd take a, a an etude book and just plop it open and just read from the top left down to the bottom. You know, just constantly working to try and pl play the ink, play exactly what's on the page. But this idea that as an improviser that you have this kind of ultimate liberation for expression that then can move, that can leak into, you know, your more traditional, you know, approach to playing. I think that's a really, really great um, point that you made that um, it really uh, enhances your ability to express yourself, you know, even when you're playing. And, and what else is music for? I yeah. mean, you know, yeah. it's an expression. It's a human expression. Yeah. We were, visiting a little bit before uh, we went live um, about a number of different things, but um, we had worked together previously um, when I was in Nashville, and we were talking a little bit about the organ there at the Skirmerhorn Symphony Center, and I just was curious if you could take a moment and tell us a little bit about, you know, some of the f favorite instruments that you've played, um, what it is that you think really um, makes for a, a good instrument. They're very they're very complicated and can have a lot of moving parts and a lot of organic components to them and they require lots and lots of maintenance. They're, I think in many ways they're an instrument that people see a lot but don't always know very much about. But do you have, do you have favorite organs that you've played around the U.S. or around the world? In, in a way, I, I guess I, the, uh, the overall answer to that question is uh, who, who's your favorite friend? <laughs> <laughs> don't want to say who your favorite friend is because and, and I actually have many favorite friends and I feel the same way about organs they're a lot like people they're very different from each other there's small ones there's big ones there's loud ones the soft ones and for me it's finding the voice of the instrument I am with at the time that to me is what and I make it my favorite instrument a few years ago I was at Smith College and there was an English horn stop that was absolutely beautiful, but E flat above C, middle C was very sour and very out of tune. And I was kind of fooling around with it and listening to it. And right then the organ builders came in and said, oh, Peter, yep, we'll, we'll take care of that. I said, no, don't touch it. Because I was doing a movie that had this incredibly distasteful character. And I knew that if, as long as I avoided E flat, during the improvisations, I'd be okay. But when that character came on, <laughs> all of a sudden we had this thing. And you should, the audience just cracked up because they're like, oh my God, how is he doing that? And it's, you know, and, uh, but yes, there are some places that must be mentioned. Notre Dame Cathedral, I had the pleasure of playing there really twice. Uh, an amazing space instrument in history. Uh, the Kachmar organ in Maine. Uh, is a magnificent instrument. Right now, I'm, I'll show you a picture if it's okay. This is uh, yeah, please this do. Is the Performing Arts Center organ in, in Providence, Rhode Island. There it is. It looks that's very, in, it's extremely ornate, isn't it? That's right. That's a 1927 Wurlitzer, and it's in really tough shape, but we're coaxing it back to life, and hopefully we'll get a restoration done for this organ, a major restoration. And what's nice is I've been able to be down there and really analyze the instrument and see what it needs. Also in Boston, I'm very lucky. We have all sorts of different types of organs, the mechanical action organs. We have incredible Bach organs like uh, the um, 
Riches and Fouts organ, which is a tractor action organ that plays Bach beautifully at the Lutheran Church. And we have a gigantic E.M. Skinner with four sets of 32-foot pipes surrounding the audience. Wow. And boy, those work well for cannons. <laughs> Good stuff. That's fantastic. Um, you mentioned Bach organs, and I know from... Um, reading your bio that you've been heralded for incredible Bach interpretations. I was just going to ask, is there, other than the, ex, you know, the kind of emotional expression um, that you might uh, have developed as an improviser, to, to what extent are you able to actually improvise within the context of a Bach performance? Is that typical? Well, I think that's one of those places where you must play the notes. Um, it's also one of those places where, although there's incredible uh, knowledge and academic study as to what we think it was like, mm -hmm. don't really know the whole picture, but that should always be brought into the picture as to, you know, what is the historical background of this music and how should it be played? Um, and at the same time, I point to someone such as Sikowski, the conductor. I think we have, I think Peter's frozen. Let's see if he comes back. Come back. Have I come back? Okay, I think we have you back. Yay, thank you. I don't know where I left you. Can you hear me now? Yes. I think your 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 video is a little broken up, so I, I think maybe it's just your internet signal on your end, but we can hear you. Probably. Sorry about that. No, no, it's quite all right. Um. I also wanted to ask you just briefly a little bit about the American Guild of Organists. Um, and, you know, your involvement with that organization, I know that um, it has a mission to, um, you know, bring forward um, organ repertoire, and uh, it's a great uh, place in which organists uh, can come together, and I, we, I was involved in helping to host an AGO co conference when I was in um, Nashville, and there are different chapters. Are you active with AGO there in Boston? Yes, I've actually been honored to be the dean of the Boston chapter a few years ago. Um, and the American Guild of Organists was a one. <laughs> we'll wait and see if we get him back. Peter, are you there? Well, folks, we'll wait just a minute here, see if we can get Peter back. He was having a few internet issues prior to our live broadcast. So I've got a little bit of information. Oh, it looks like we lost his video too. About the film Nosferatu. I'll just vamp here for a second and share some of this information with you. Um, this is the film that uh, he's to be improvising to in our second season. Um, it's Nosferatu, it's called A Symphony of Horror. Um, it's a 1922 silent uh, film. Um, uh, uh, originally, uh, well, done as uh, in Germany, um, and it is loosely based on the Bram Stoker uh, 1897 novel Dracula. Um, it's an un it's an unauthorized adaptation, which I found very interesting um, as we were researching this. A number of the characters 
names were changed in the film um, in order to avoid copyright issues. And even with several details altered, Stoker's heir sued over the adaptation and a court, ru court ruling ordered all copies of the film to be destroyed at the time. Um, however, a number of prints of Nosferatu survived. Um, I've done this film before with Peter uh, in Nashville. It really is a, it's a cult classic. It's a super creepy film. Um, he does a fantastic job of improvising to the film. And um, the U.S. premiere for that film was June 3rd, 1929, seven years after its original premiere in Germany. So we're, we're uh, I hate that we were cut short, but we were having so much fun talking to Peter, um, but I don't know that he's going to be able to get back with us and finish up our interview today. Um, thank you, Peter, for spending time with us. Uh, we look forward to having you back. Nosferatu is scheduled for performance here at the McKnight Center on October 29, 2020. Um, we don't have single tickets on sale yet, but if you're interested in attending that performance, um, you can get in the queue by getting on our waiting list. You can contact our box office by calling 405-744-9999 or emailing us at info at mcknightcenter.org. Um, we had several viewer questions lined up for Peter. I'm sorry for those of you watching online that we didn't get to those questions. Maybe we'll have an opportunity to do a little makeup interview with Peter at a later date. Um, thanks so much for joining us today. Please join us next week. Um, it's our final um, episode of Orange Plate Special that we currently have scheduled, uh, Wednesday, July 29th at 12 noon. Um, oh, it looks like I'm going to see if I can get Peter back here real fast. Okay. There we go. Fantastic. Sorry about that. No, no, it's quite all right. I'm glad you got back because I was I was wrapping up. I was starting to close things out. So you were talking a little bit about um, nice <laughs> um, about your involvement with AGO in Boston right. and that you had served in the dean capacity. And I was just going to ask you to share a little bit about um, what AGO is. Well, the American Guild of Organists uh, is actually having a virtual convention right now, uh, which is really great. You can go to their page and you can see concerts every night at 8 o'clock. They're having hour-long concerts from all over the country, including the music that uh, was originally going to be, um, uh, was premiered for that convention. So you can learn all about them at American Guild of Organists. And uh, it's just been a great, a great thing to be yeah. a part of. Yeah, it was really yeah. wonderful to um, play a small part in um, bringing when that convention went, was in Nashville and I was involved. It was really fantastic. And I think we did an organ. We may have premiered a new work, a commission with the, with the symphony. Yeah, I believe you did. Yeah, I think that's right. Yeah. Um, that great? Peter, we've got a couple of questions from online viewers. Um, Rebecca is asking... Um, what is your favorite silent film to accompany? Do you have a favorite? Uh, that's that's it. There we go again with that I know. answer. More favorites. Um, I, I, it, it all depends on what the film is. The thing is that they're also different. Um, for instance, behind me is a poster for from Japan of the swashbuckling uh, mas the, the Mask of Zorro. And then there's also the big biblical epics. They're all very different. I would say that I actually do have a favorite comedian despite the fact that he keeps on coming up, <laughs> uh, I love Buster Keaton more than anybody. Okay. Because uh, he, to me, uh, you know, th this guy would, you know, stab you with a fork and make you laugh. And then uh, definitely Harold Lloyd should be your lawyer because he's really smart and his daughter's still in charge of the estate. <laughs> uh, but Buster Keaton, if you had a plumbing problem, you know, I, if you're new to silent films, go to Buster Keaton really fun fantastic and um, one more question here from online viewers this is from hunter who's saying as a church organist myself uh hunter saying that uh i enjoy good friday music the most and the question is is there a favorite season of the church year when you really enjoy your performances well yes indeed 
Christmas is lovely, but the depth and the, the intensity of Holy Week is really hard to beat. Uh, that entire week, starting with, uh, for those of us that are Christian, when he enters into Jerusalem, this wild, joyful welcoming of the king that's going to save us all the way through the death and then the resurrection. Mm -hmm. it, it's pretty cool. And, uh, and there's, again, this great music that's been done for that. And it can be improvised. I go to Dur Duraflay's suite uh, of uh, improvised work. Uh, is just amazing, as well as uh, Dupre's uh, Stations of the Cross. All of that's intense. And I shouldn't also, uh, I should also let you know that I'm also a musician in a synagogue. And during High Holy Days, we also have an incredible variety of music from all over the world, the Ashkenazi and choral tradition, uh, to the folk music, all of it speaking about really religious music is about the human condition. And what is our relationship to each other and something greater than us? And I think that that's a great place to have music be serving. It absolutely is. I don't know a lot of organ repertoire, but the Vidor is definitely one of my favorites. Um, Peter, thanks so much for joining us today. Uh, we've had a lot of fun talking to you. We had a great time with you um, last Halloween, and we very much look forward to the opportunity to have you back at the McKnight Center to perform uh, along with Nosferatu and hopefully a lot of other things. Um, I was uh, mentioning earlier about how to get tickets to this. You can call our box office at 405-744-9999 or you can email us at info at mcknightcenter.org. Next week's episode of Orange Plate Special, Wednesday, July 29th, again at 12 noon, um, we feature National Geographic Live explorer Dr. Maria Mayer, who is a scientist, an explorer, a wildlife correspondent, a primatologist, anthropologist, um, wrote a book called Pink Boots and a Machete, and she's going to have some really fascinating stories to share with us on next week's episode. So we hope that you all will tune in again next week. Thanks so much for joining us, and thank you again, Peter, for your time today. It's been a lot of fun. Great to be here. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.